Welcome back to A-Level Geography Explained. This video is a full topic summary of the coast's topic for last-minute revision. Let's dive in. 1. The Littoral Zone and Coastal Classifications Coastal landscapes are part of the littoral zone, which is the area where the land meets the sea. This zone is dynamic and constantly changing due to interactions between land-based and marine processes. The littoral zone can be split into four subzones, the backshore, which is only affected by waves during storms, the foreshore, which lies between the high and low tide marks, the nearshore, where wave processes occur, and the offshore, which is beyond the influence of breaking waves. The shape, features and changes to this zone depend on geology, wave energy, sea level change, and human activity. Coastlines are also classified in different ways. They can be classified by geology, such as rocky coastlines with cliffs and resistant geology, sandy coastlines dominated by deposition, or estuarine coastlines with mudflats and tidal influences. They can also be defined by energy levels, such as high-energy coastlines where destructive waves dominate and low-energy coastlines where constructive waves are more common. Additionally, coastlines can be classified by balance of inputs and outputs of sediment, with erosional coastlines experiencing greater erosion than deposition and depositional coastlines where sediment is deposited more rapidly than it is removed. 2. Geological Structure and Coastal Morphology The geology of the coast, including both the type of rock and the structure of rock formations, plays a critical role in shaping coastal landforms. Hard rocks such as granite, basalt and limestone are more resistant to erosion, forming steep cliffs and prominent headlands. Softer rocks such as clay, shale or unconsolidated sands erode quickly, forming bays or low-lying coastlines. Geological structure refers to the way rocks are layered, folded or faulted. On concordant coastlines, rock layers run parallel to the coast, and erosion often exploits lines of weakness to form features such as coves, with Lulworth Cove on the Dorset coast being a well-known example. On discordant coastlines, where different rock types lie perpendicular to the shoreline, the contrast in resistance creates alternating headlands and bays, as seen along the Dorset coastline. Joints, bedding planes, faults and folds all contribute to how susceptible rock is to marine erosion. Heavily jointed rocks or those with faults tend to erode faster. Geological dip, referring to whether rock layers slope towards or away from the sea, also affects the stability of cliffs and the rate of erosion. These structural elements create unique and varied coastal landscapes, contributing to the formation of stacks, stumps, arches and wave-cut platforms. 3. Marine Erosion and Weathering Processes Coastal landscapes are shaped by a combination of marine erosion, weathering, and mass movement. Marine erosion includes for key processes. Hydraulic action occurs when waves force air into cracks in the rock, creating pressure that weakens and eventually breaks apart the rock. Abrasion involves sediment carried by waves grinding against the cliff face, wearing it down over time. Attrition takes place when rocks and pebbles collide with each other in the surf zone, gradually breaking into smaller and smoother particles. Corrosion, also known as solution, is when weak acids in seawater dissolve soluble rock such as limestone or chalk. Weathering processes also shape the coast. Mechanical weathering includes freeze-thaw weathering, where water enters cracks, freezes, and expands, causing the rock to fracture. Salt crystallization occurs when salt water evaporates, leaving salt crystals that grow and exert pressure on the rock. Chemical weathering, such as carbonation, affects carbonate rocks like limestone as rainwater containing dissolved carbon dioxide reacts with calcium carbonate. Biological weathering involves plant roots widening cracks and burrowing animals disturbing and loosening rock material. Mass movement processes include rock falls, where loose rocks fall from a cliff face at landslides, where entire sections of a slope move downslope, rotational slumping, which involves curved surfaces and often occurs in weak clay, and soil creep, a very slow form of movement. These processes are especially active on weak, unconsolidated cliffs and are often triggered by heavy rainfall or undercutting by wave action at the base of cliffs. 4. Waves, Tides and Currents 
waves are formed by wind blowing across the surface of the sea. The energy of a wave is determined by wind speed, wind duration, and the fetch, which is the distance over which the wind blows. Constructive waves have a strong swash and a weak backwash. They deposit material and build up beaches. Destructive waves, by contrast, have a strong backwash that removes sediment from the beach. These are more common during storms and in high-energy environments. Tides are the regular rise and fall of sea levels caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun tidal range affects the vertical extent of coastal erosion and deposition. In areas with high tidal range, such as the Bristol Channel, marine processes operate over a much wider area of the coastline. Ocean currents, including longshore currents and rip currents, transport sediment along or away from the coast. Longshore drift is particularly important in shaping depositional features. It moves sediment in a zigzag pattern along the shore due to the angle of wave approach, often resulting in the formation of spits and other landforms. 5. Sediment Sources and the Sediment Cell Model Sediment that shapes the coastline comes from various sources. Terrestrial sources include river discharge delivering fine sediment, weathering and mass movement of cliff material, and wind-blown sediment from inland areas. Marine sources involve material transported into the area by waves and currents. Human sources include beach nourishment projects and coastal engineering that introduce new material into the system. The sediment cell model divides the coastline into self-contained units where inputs, transfers, and outputs of sediment occur. Each sediment cell is a closed system, meaning that sediment is largely recycled within it rather than transferred between cells. There are 11 sediment cells around England and Wales. Understanding sediment cells helps inform sustainable coastal management by recognizing that interference in one part of the coast can affect another part downstream, potentially undermining defenses or increasing erosion elsewhere. 6. Erosional landforms and coastal retreat. Over time, marine erosion and subaerial processes form distinct landforms. Headlands and bays result from differential erosion of discordant coastlines. Cliffs are shaped by undercutting at the base by waves, leading to collapse and retreat. This forms wave-cut notches and eventually wave-cut platforms that are exposed at low tide. Where weaknesses in rock are exploited by hydraulic action and abrasion, caves can form. Continued erosion deepens the cave until it breaks through to the other side of a headland to form an arch. Over time, the roof of the arch collapses, leaving an isolated pillar of rock called a stack, which eventually erodes into a stump. This sequence is clearly visible at Old Harry Rocks on the Dorset coast. Coastal retreat is the process of the coastline moving inland due to erosion. This is especially rapid on soft coastlines such as the Holderis Coast in Yorkshire, where boulder clay cliffs erode by several metres each year. This has significant consequences for infrastructure, housing and livelihoods, requiring careful planning and management. 7. Depositional Landforms and Vegetation Succession Deposition occurs when waves lose energy and drop the sediment they are carrying. Over time, this forms beaches, spits, bars and tombolos. Beaches can be swash-aligned, shaped by constructive waves that approach the coast head-on, or drift-aligned, formed by longshore drift that moves material parallel to the coastline. Spits form where longshore drift continues past a change in the coastline's direction or across a river mouth. Spurn Head on the Holderus Coast is a classic example of a recurved spit formed in this way. Where a spit grows across a bay and joins two headlands, a bar is formed, which can trap water to create a lagoon. A tombolo is a spit that connects the mainland to an offshore island, such as Sheasel Beach linking to the Isle of Portland. Vegetation stabilizes depositional landforms. On sand dunes, pioneer species such as marum grass colonize bare sand, beginning the process of plant succession. Over time, the dunes develop layers of soil and support more complex vegetation communities. Similarly, salt marshes develop behind spits in low-energy environments. These marshes go through vegetation succession from pioneer species such as eelgrass to a fully developed halophytic ecosystem. 8. Sea level change and submergent and emergent landforms. 
Changes in sea level influence coastal landscapes in significant ways. Eustatic sea level change refers to global changes in sea level, often caused by melting ice sheets or thermal expansion of seawater as a result of rising temperatures. Isostatic change occurs when land rises or sinks relative to the sea due to tectonic activity, glacial loading or post-glacial rebound. Emergent landforms are created when land rises relative to sea level. Raised beaches and fossil cliffs, found in western Scotland, are evidence of past sea levels and indicate where the coastline once was before isostatic uplift following the last ice age. Submergent landforms occur when the sea floods previously dry land. Rias, such as the Kingsbridge Estuary in Devon, are drowned river valleys. Fjords, found in Norway, are drowned glacial valleys with steep sides and deep water. Dalmatian coasts, like those in Croatia, form where parallel valleys are flooded, leaving behind narrow, elongated islands that run parallel to the coastline. 9. Coastal flooding and risk management. Some coastlines are more vulnerable to flooding due to low elevation, high population density and limited protection. Rising sea levels, storm surges and increased storm intensity all contribute to heightened flood risk. In Bangladesh, the combination of rising seas, tropical cyclones and land subsidence has placed millions of people at risk. In the United Kingdom, storm surges during the winter of 2013 to 2014 caused extensive coastal flooding and damage across multiple regions. Flood risk can be managed through a range of approaches. Hard engineering includes sea walls, groins, and revetments. These offer direct protection but are often expensive and can cause erosion further along the coast by interrupting natural processes. Soft engineering includes beach nourishment and dune stabilization. These approaches work with natural processes and are often more sustainable in the long term. Forecasting Early warning systems and evacuation plans help reduce the impact of storm surges and flooding. Adaptation strategies, including managed retreat and land use planning, are becoming increasingly important as climate change leads to higher sea levels and more frequent extreme weather events. 10. Coastal management strategies and conflict. Managing the coast involves balancing environmental, economic and social factors. Integrated coastal zone management promotes a holistic, long-term approach that involves all stakeholders. It aims to work with natural processes and protect vulnerable areas in a sustainable manner. Management options include holding the line to maintain current defenses, advancing the line to extend the coast seaward, manage retreat to allow natural processes to take over, and doing nothing in areas where intervention is not economically viable. These strategies are often controversial and can lead to conflict. At Happisburg in Norfolk, the decision to allow erosion and not defend the coastline led to the loss of properties and significant community upset. In contrast, the Medmery Managed Retreat Scheme in West Sussex was successful in creating a new salt marsh habitat and protecting nearby homes by allowing farmland to flood. Decision-making is often informed by cost-benefit analysis and environmental impact assessments, but with limited resources and rising sea levels, difficult choices must be made about which areas to protect. Thanks for watching. I hope this video helped with your revision. Check out my detailed revision series and share this channel with friends. Goodbye.